have set up the uh, the subtitle is a historical and philosophical study of 9/11, and that's really important. I ask loads of historical questions. I ask philosophical questions. You know, so what? So it was a conspiracy. So maybe people in the American intelligence knew. Maybe some offshore intelligence people helped. So what? You know, that attitude of so what is something I've had to deal with a lot as a teacher, because you know you explain like. There's this tragedy and that tragedy. And kids are so numb. They're numb. They watch horror movies all the time. They they see their parents beating each other up and whatever, whatever. And they're just numb, right? So they say, so what? <laughs> well, you know, so I, I address that question, so what? So what if 9-11 was a partly inside job and the whole thing was a stitch up by the media in collusion with... Uh, extremist groups in American society that wanted to demonize Islam <coughs> and invade Iraq and steal oil. Well, there's a lot of so what's in that narrative. I go into them all. And then there's, uh, the subtitle is Critical Questions, Critical Times, A Historical and Philosophical Study of 9 11. You know, these are, these are difficult times we're living through. Ever since 2001, I mean, some people listening to this may not have even been alive then, but I remember that event in, in, with incredible detail. Um, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. And I've been trying to find out what happened ever since. This is my provisional offering. And the final subtitle is Towards a Historical Commission of Inquiry into 9-11. Now, I'm not saying, as I say, I've written the definitive thing. No, I'm just calling for a commission of historians and you know, architects and engineers can only do so much. It's very important what they've done. But they can't find the truth. They can point to the fact that the existing uh, narratives are false. Um, there's other evidence that needs other types of explanations, like the buildings are pre-wired or something. Um, it's only historians can join up all those, those things. <clears throat> and so that's what I've done. And that's why I wrote it. And you're welcome to read it. You know, I'd appreciate any comments and so on. It's two volumes. That's volume one. Why am I talking about this? Because <clears throat> if it's true, and the working hypothesis of the book is that the Bush narrative of Al-Qaeda did it alone, 17 guys, that's the end of story, Bin Laden. If that's false, and other people were involved, then we've been lied to consistently, ruthlessly, and horrifically ever since... And what it means our government structures, our military intelligence structures in the USA and tangentially elsewhere have been, like, you know, retooled for the purposes of lying and what you could call epistemological um, suppression. And this is what Zubanov talks about. She talks about, through the use of surveillance capitalism, <coughs> It's now got to the point where we can be you know, suppressed for thinking the wrong thoughts, we can be silenced, we can be uh, you know, taught to how to think the right thoughts. Uh, well, that's, that's not cricket, to use an old analogy. I was quite good at cricket. I, I know how cricket works as a game. I played many great games. I was never you know, that good, but I was a, a middle-order batsman and a reasonable bowler. And I know how you stick to the rules. <clears throat> well, this, this lot that have taken over the world, at least ever since 9-11, are not sticking to the rules. They're gaining the system, and surveillance capitalism is a good name for it. Whoever did 9-11 are proto-surveillance capitalists. <clears throat> and it's interesting that Sashana mentions 9-11 as a critical moment in history. Um, I hope she will join the 9-11 uh, Historical Commission of Inquiry. Um, so what can we do about it? I mean, I don't want to leave you with grim, grim thoughts. Um, so we've been lied to. So what's new? You know, <laughs> in ancient China, the, the tyrannical tyrants who took over Chinese society, they, you know, they, they did all this. I mean, they, they tried to kill all the Confucianists who were talking about morality. You, you weren't allowed to mention Confucius. And then they buried alive, 400 Confucian scholars. The then Qin emperor thought he would suppress discourse about morality and ethics because it was dangerous to his fanatical and cruel rule. 
and and that's why Nero had Paul and, and Peter executed, you know. That's why Tiberius allowed Jesus to be executed. These corrupt, tyrannical rulers don't want to be spoken to about ethics. It's the last thing they want. <coughs> and so they suppress it, they, they bury it. And and uh, but you know, we go on, like Bram. The head keeps speaking truth, uh, or like Orpheus, whose head floats down the river. In my Druid encyclopedia of Druid studies, I've pointed out the Bran story and the Orphic story are the same. They go back to the same origin. And the point is that the prophetic genius of the Druid seer, prophet, whatever, <coughs> cannot be silenced. And so what do we do? Well, you know, my strategy is now I'm developing this notion of religious mathematics and I'm writing the third volume of my Principia Mathematica you know I'm, I'm trying to do what Newton left undone which is write the final volume he said in Principia Mathematica you know I've talked about how gravity works how the universe holds together but I haven't explained why it's got something to do with God <coughs> and then he stopped well I'm trying to finish that last third volume and it's called the Philosophiae Religionis Principia Mathematica this is the second volume, and it's a treatise on the overlapping knowledge fields of religious studies and mathematics. Now, this has never been attempted before. Some have done little bits of this. I'm doing the kind of the, the, the grand oeuvre. And it's, it's epic. It's taking, you know, five hours a day for the last, uh, you know, however long until I finish it. <clears throat> the final work will be four volumes, and I'm nearly, you know... Towards coming up towards the end of volume three, it's it's epic, <clears throat> and what I'm arguing is that we need to get ethics and morality as as finessed and as specifically like structured as we have mathematical knowledge. The only reason these guys can do their surveillance capitalism is because they're very clever. They're, they're crafty digital wizards, technostics, you can call them. Well, we have to get that clever with ethics and morality. I mean, Aristotle and the great ethical teachers have always used number and, and, and Bentham and the calculus of, of hedonism or pleasure. Utilitarianism was based partly on some of ethical mathematics. And so I'm taking that idea a step further. And I'm saying that um, we need to develop this discourse in schools, in in our daily lives. <clears throat> and the whole question of religious literacy and numeracy comes up. The, the world is suffering from an outbreak of, of what, what has been called an epidemic of ignorance. But it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's an epidemic caused by religious and, and moral illiteracy and um, you know, lack of numeracy. <clears throat> and I've been researching that and working on that chapter at the moment. And you know, there's a very important professor, Diana uh, Moore, of Harvard University, uh, who's been teaching about religious literacy. She's written a book about how, in America, the levels of religious literacy are very, very poor at the moment. <clears throat> They've been getting steadily worse. So, even about their own religions, even, you know, Christians or whatever, don't know much about their own religion. And when it comes to other religions, like Islam or Judaism, they... They, they are really failing at the task. And Dinah Moore set up with the American Academy of Religion a project to get some degree of religious literacy in all schools in America. You know, long, long overdue. Because <clears throat> the reason that things like QAnon can flourish in America is because the people are really so lacking in religious literacy that any old conspiracy stuff involving aliens, UFOs and and, uh, you know, terrible Muslims, it's going to catch fire and, and catch on. So this question of what, what is religious literacy is very important. Um, and that's what I'm working on at the moment. This is part of my antidote. As a philosopher, I'm going to argue that education, religious studies, philosophy, morality, ethics, history, the humanities, the arts, music, dance spirituality, meditation, you know, all those things we love to do as humans, um, love making, you know, falling in love, all this stuff is so important, it's the lifeblood of humanity. Those are our counter-weapons against evil, 
and against ignorance. Uh, the respect for your family, your love for your family, respect for nature. You know, the, we have to marshal the forces of light. Now, <clears throat> if I have time, I'm going to write a sequel to The Battle of the Trees, the great Druid poem about when the trees come to save the forces of light. You know, and evil forces come out of the earth and try and take over the kingdom. And the trees themselves rally round to preserve and defend the forces of light. Well, that's what we need now. We need the trees themselves to come forward and, and rally the, you know, the resistance to evil. And that's what I'm trying to do with my little weekly broadcasts and fastings. And with my writing and my periodic table and my uh, religious um, literacy and numeracy work in Principia Mathematica. Okay, um, <coughs> because what we're up against, as I say, is an ethical collapse, a meltdown, be it at the royal family, at the Tory party, in the British state, uh, be it in Israel, where Netanyahu is clinging to power, although a deeply compromised and corrupt person, as it was in America with Trump and all he stood for. These people are really corrupt, um, evil people. Um, possibly circles in Russia as well have been you know, doing some rather dodgy stuff. Um, Putin's oligarchical uh, rule seems to be premised, and, and I'm, you know, disappointed. Um, or some of what's come up in, in the um, revelations of Craig Unger, uh, you know, I suspend judgment on, on, obviously, but some of what's been going on is, is deeply troubling in Russia and in other countries around the world. <coughs> So we need a total moral reformation of, of, of this planet. We need a, uh, an education <clears throat> that, that can remind us what we're supposed to be doing here on this planet, which is passing in the school of souls, as Keats, uh, Keats put it, you know, graduating through <clears throat> righteousness, intelligence, right action and compassion, as Buddha pointed out so many years ago. You know, it's no point praying to this or that God, you've got to do the moral work yourself. It's what the Bible calls righteousness. You've got to cultivate that righteousness yourself individually. That's what you're accountable for. So, and this is why I think, uh, what kind of religious and moral education will do this globally? <clears throat> you know, how are we going to get there? Well, it's interesting, today I'm recording this on the 8th of, uh, sorry, the 7th of March, the day before Women's Day. <clears throat> and today is the day on which um, Thomas Aquinas died. 7th of March used to be his official feast day in the church. They've changed it to January, but I think it should be today. That was his death day. Aquinas was a great thinker, <clears throat> and he was a systematic, profound scholar, and I respect him for that. He had an accident. He was on his way to Lyon, not far from me, to come to a council. He was galloping along on his horse, and he hit a branch with his horse. He must have been deep in some musing. And the force of that blow uh, knocked him unconscious. He fell off his horse. And they found him and put him in a local monastery sickbed, and he died. I mean, what a tragic end. He was only in his 40s, I think. What a tragic end to such a great thinker. I think had he lived longer, you see, he just had a religious experience that had deepened his thinking. Um, he'd, he'd been very clever, he was wine and dine all over, you know, elite circles in the French court and Italy and Naples and all the rest of it. But he real and he was obviously a genius, but he realised that he hadn't gone deep enough in his thinking. He left something out. And... That had come to him in a, in a religious revelation. And after that, for a whole year leading up to his death, he never wrote another word. Because he said, everything I've said is irrelevant compared to what I've known now. Now I think that some historian, intellectual historian, a specialist in spirituality, should study that last year of Aquinas' life. What did he actually say about the experience? What happened? What sources do we have? Did he write letters? Did he talk to people? And I think that last year of his life is the most important of his whole career. Instead, of course, they made him a saint. They all study his, you know, works. But he abandoned them because he realised he had a breakthrough. 
And I'm interested in having that same breakthrough for humanity. We need to do that Aquinas leap, I call it. One thing that's very interesting, actually, that we do know about this is that <coughs> it happened, or around that time, there happened a very interesting event in the Dominican church in Naples, and I've been there. Um, he was witnessed after mass, levitating, you know, off, off the ground. In secret, he, was, he thought he was alone. He was in an ecstasy, and he was levitating. But a monk had hidden in the back pews and watched and saw and then reported. So whatever it was that Aquinas experienced, it was, it was ineffable, it was transcendental, and it, it was magical, it was supernatural. Dean Radin would love to get all his measurement counters out and measure, you know, how high did Aquinas levitate, you know. <laughs> that sort of religious mathematical question. The point is that we as a planet need to deepen our analysis. There are people stuck at, you know, the rational mind who, who are just, um, yeah, you know, the, all, all the techno geeks that are serving the military intelligence uh, surveillance capitalism system are, you know, they need to, like, <clears throat> do that moral awakening. That Aquinas had. Um, and that's why I think it would be really good for an intellectual historian to study that last year. And it culminated in this year when he died. Poor chap. Totally like just hitting his head on a branch. He never got to Lyon. <clears throat> okay, so that work has to be finished off. And that's what I'm trying to do in, in you know, my writings. And then we have the other thing I want to report this year. Uh, sorry, this week. I've produced the Mary Magdalene Studies Association journal, which I'm really pleased at. And it's, it's very beautiful. So this is a lovely painting of Mary Magdalene from the Renaissance times. And the journal has some lovely artwork in it um, <clears throat> from different sorts of sources, different you know, uh, Renaissance masterpieces and all the rest of it. And also some work from a friend of mine who lives in New England, near Lexington and Concord, where Thoreau came from. Um, <coughs> anyway, it's full of interesting stuff going on in the field of Mary Magdalene studies, which is an ongoing field. She's the patron of the Dominican order, for God's sake, and yet no Dominican has ever done this. Why, why, where are these Dominicans so-called? Um, <coughs> you know, Mary Magdalene, I think, holds a lot of the keys of the mysteries of Christ, and therefore, as an homage to her memory, I set this society up, and this is the first issue of our journal. We've had a few newsletters before. That work will continue, and this last uh, week I finally published it. You can get it, you know. Um, so that, I think, is the kind of work that's needed. <clears throat> this sort of in-depth reviewing of, of mm, the enlightenments of the past, people like Aquinas and co., Mary Magdalene, Jesus, you know, Buddha, what were their enlightenments? And then sort of working out how they can be brought back to life for us now in this strange time. One thing that's absolutely clear is ethics, morality and, and virtue, as Aristotle would say, are at the core of this. You can't reach enlightenment and be evil. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. You can be a successful techno wizard that just self-destructs and lead like a, like a moral suicide bomber. That's what the Brexiteer types are like. That's the Dominic Cummings, the Johnsons, the Goves, the, all this crew of Tories that are trotted out. These people have no moral sense. And that's why we're watching the slow motion catastrophe. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to finish there. I commend everyone to their homework for this week, which is to uh, you know, study Aquinas' leap. What happened when he made that breakthrough? into a higher kind of knowing. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things I also read about this week is, is the study of joy and the French concept of um, jouissance. And I've been researching French philosophers like Irigare and others who've talked about jouissance with Lacan. And this is quite an obscure branch of French thought, but it's really interesting because what they're trying to find out is do men and women have the same kind of approach to joy. What is joy? You know, is it about 
totally abandoning the body, like, like Aquinas did. I mean, he was a virgin until he died. He never had, he never fell in love, never had a kiss, as far as we know. Um, <clears throat> or Marnie, who was the highest form of these sort of celibate types. Um, or is it actually enjoying, um, you know, um, the physicality that we have? <clears throat> sharing that in love with someone. Where is joy? And so these French philosophers, Irigaray, Lacan, and others, um, have analysed this in great detail, which is fascinating. And I was working on the mathematics of joyism, <clears throat> which is a word I've coined, to counter that of terrorism. The planet is suffering from terrorism. <clears throat> We've got to get over that. And the only way we can do that is conceptually is to think through a new form of thinking which I call joyism. We do acts of righteousness, kindness, love, compassion. Yes, we can make our political statements. We can say we want a free Palestine or we want, you know, uh, equality for the, all races in America. But we do it joyously. We do it using um, <coughs> intelligent, non-violent types of activities. And as a teacher, you know, I, I try and teach joyously because I believe in the good news that the kingdom of God is on its way, <laughs> and it is going to be joyful, and we will get there. I know it's been difficult, especially with the pandemic and everything, <clears throat> um, but let's hang in there, keep the faith, and um, we will, you know, we will transform this planet, because we have that potential, that spark of joy, each one of us within us, that spark of love in our conscience and our soul. Right, I'm going to finish with a poem, as is my wont, because um, <clears throat> enough prose. And I'm going to read from, let's try this volume. This was between 2010 and 2012, these poems. This is called The Poem of the World. God... You hide yourself inside us as you place us here. Then vanish into the swirling clouds and grow slow as the uprisen trees from seed. We make lists and calculate the categories, but no sooner done than you've moved on like thought Racing ahead of the poem, the pen can hardly keep up. It may be there's a pattern <clears throat> which exists in an incomprehensible language, in some far-flung region of the universe, where stars go at the end of their tether and get scattered into question marks of infinitely small particles. It may be that it's light there and here, and the seeing, and the moment, always the same, always new, adventuring. If we have to give an account of it all, how we've spoken in this dark, or not spoken, let me light a few questions to fill the aching, a searching for love, for another heart equal and a mind yearning to reach the edge of things and become infinite, and a love song to beauty, always an addendum to the stars, their asking and their bursting forth with praise for darkness, and then stretching back into themselves, dark, praising light, and round again, the poem of the world.